Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I'm David Delaney, your host, and I'm joined today by Philip Hum, the founder of The Power of Storytelling. How are you doing today, Philip? I'm great. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. I, you know, it's it's um, a really important topic to salespeople to uh, figure out storytelling. I think that um, it's not used enough, especially in the tech industry. <laughs> and um, you know, getting your background, how did you how did you get into the sales and storytelling universe, and then start your company, uh, Power of Story Storytelling? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, let me share a little bit more how I ended up in the storytelling universe. For me, actually, as your folks are mostly tech folks here, they can relate. Uh, I think it was about two and a half years ago, Uber went through these big rounds of layoffs in Amsterdam. I was back then a product manager and they cut 30% of the workforce, including myself. And um, when that happened, obviously, hey, pff, sucks no matter what, right? But after that, the reaction was first to just apply for other roles, similar roles, everything very comparable. But when I already got the first job offer, then after that, I looked at the offer and I thought, man, is, is this really, let's say, what I want to do for the rest of my life, right? I, I like working in tech. I like my job before, but is it the stuff now that makes me happy, that gives me this drive, this purpose for the rest of my life? And I just thought, you know what, um, let me actually try something else. And then um, from that point onwards, I just tried many, many different, a little bit weird things as well, I'd say. And uh, um, the one thing that I really, really liked in that time was storytelling. I did a bunch of courses, thought that I was actually quite okay at it. And um, then after some time, just seeing that a lot of the courses there, they're very theoretical. They very much, I'd say, teacher telling us, this is how you use the hero's journey, but not really pragmatic for business and even less so for sales. And then I just thought, hey, I can probably do a better job just taking my background, combining that with storytelling. And so I just went for it pretty much, took the cold lunch and started my own business. Oh, that's amazing. So now you're uh, kind of in the wilderness here. What, what, how do you feel about um, going from a corporate environment to running your own business? Um, honestly, loving it so far. Sure, you go through these cycles, right, where a lot of emotions are good, but also bad emotions. But I'd say just going in these workshops and programs and seeing actually people uh, just transforming their storytelling skills, feeling more confident in how they communicate. That's something that I've never experienced before. And so this is just one thing that I absolutely love about being self-employed. Plus, I think I, I hate just uh, following authority. So I, I think I just like, uh, yeah, pretty much doing my own stuff. Yeah, that's, that's uh, one, one, of the, one of the things uh, after you've done this for a while that, that you become unemployable after that. Because, yeah. But, uh, you know, you, ne you never know. But, uh, I, you know, you're never following know. your passion, right? So. Um, so, you know, in the tech industry, salespeople do a lot of demos and, and, um, you know, it's a very rote repetitious thing and it's, you know, there's not a lot of storytelling. So why, why do you think storytelling is important in sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you talk about demos, right, that that's the perfect example. Anyone right now that is listening to this, think about, Hey, when you show a demo, do you think that your buyer will remember that demo a day later, a week later, a month later, a year later? No freaking chance, right? Absolutely no chance. And that's the thing what we do often in business, right? We use demos, we use arguments, we use logic, we use facts to make our point, but that's very unmemorable. And so stories come in there to make something much more memorable so that a week later, your buyer will be like, ah, wait a second. David, yeah, I remember him. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he had a pretty cool story that I think he can solve our problems. Mm. Yep. And and so what what would a story what you know uh entail as far as you know, if you get you're getting on a call with someone who took a call, you know, to learn about the product and if it might be able to help them, um, where where does a story come in? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say let's talk about two very big use cases and 
these ones, your listeners can already start implementing pretty much today. So let's talk about the first one, which is connection stories. Connection stories are much more just to build that initial report at the beginning. So imagine you meet someone, a buyer for, um, and how do you usually spend these first two minutes with that buyer, right? You talk about weather, you talk about traffic, you talk about maybe COVID, right? But we spend these first two minutes of small talk in a very also unmemorable and standard way. And so that would be an ideal opportunity to bring in a tiny, tiny story, not a big one, but a tiny story. Hmm. As an example, if you ask me today, hey, Philip, how are you? I would then say something like, um, you know what, David, really good. This morning, I went to my favorite coffee place. And right when I got my card out, the owner, Joey, he said, a good Philip, this one is on the house. I, mm. Why? Anyway, he made my day that day. When was the last time that someone was, I don't know, nice to you for no reason? And how was that for you? You see, mm. it's now I bring in a short story. Now you may think, ah, oh, this is too big for me, but still, hey, then don't bring in a big story, bring in an interesting fact about yourself. Anything that gets the conversation flowing that is a little bit more personal, that shows a little bit more as you about you as a human, and then bring it back with a question, right? It's as important asking the right question to make the other person open up. So that would, be, that would be one opportunity to tell a great story, right? Just the first one or two minutes within any interaction that you have. Next time someone asks you, how are you? Just respond with a tiny story. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And that's interesting because I, I was thinking you usually start by saying now, now that we use zoom for all the sales calls, um, where are you and how's the weather over there or something like that. And it's just like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's, it's not bad. Right. But if we just yeah. think how much hours, days of our life have we spent on some topics like that where we didn't learn anything at all. And they were completely yeah. forgettable after that. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's in our control to turn that around, right? To make the flip. Okay. So a tiny story about your something that happened to you today or, you know, a, a, a something good or a, a tiny factoid about yourself that, that kind of breaks the ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something maybe interesting that happened lately, maybe a new skill that you picked up, maybe even some small thing that annoyed you. Really, the opportunities are endless there. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And what is, is, that, is that a connection story? That's a connection story. Exactly. Got it. And okay. If you want to, now the one that I think is probably the most common one then after connection stories um, is then the success story, right? The customer success story. That would be very relevant for a lot of your listeners right now because that's usually one that could replace or could be a great addition to a demo. Because let's say you're having this demo and you're flipping through it, but before even flipping through that demo, Let's say you have a good understanding of what your buyer, what pain points they have, right? And then instead of just going straight away into the demo, you ask the buyer, you ask, um, you know what, um, David, I think, would it be helpful if I shared an example of another customer who was in a similar situation as you? Now, I can tell you a little bit more about what problems he had or she had and how she overcame that. And then I go into that story. I ask you, hey, do you actually want to hear it? I don't just tell you that story, but I ask you, do you want to hear that story? And see, I use the word examples, not like story because stories create wrong expectations. But I say, I ask you, hey, do you want to hear an example about a similar customer? And then I dive into the story. Now, these success stories, they're usually about customers who are satisfied using your product. And when you construct them, you focus on, okay, in what state was that customer before meeting you? How did you help that customer? And then what was the result of that? What a lot of companies already have that to some degree when they think about all the internal marketing materials. What you want to do when you talk about a customer success story, you want to make it personal. So you want to make it about a specific person. So you say, hey, Bob for, from accounting at this, a games company in uh, in New York. 
you want to make it as personal as possible because otherwise we're just getting into this big pool of case studies that are equally unmemorable as demonstrations. Okay. So, so it, it's, it's, you want to bring it to the, the personal level, not necessarily we worked with this, you know, five-star company and here's what we did. That's not the focus of it. It's about that, that, that actual person that you helped with your solution. Okay. Mm-hmm. Got it. And, um, you know, one thing I, I find with sales calls um, is that the, the salesperson starts talking, you know, long winded answers about their company and the, the, all the ones and zeros and everything that they do. And it kind of, you kind of lose the audience um, because they're just w- talking endlessly about their product and not really, um, you know, connecting it back to the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a way that the story can help in that regard? Because it sounds like you're helping being, being the story. You're helping me to, to realize myself in the role of the, the hero of the story, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it can definitely help. Obviously, with stories, you sometimes also risk that you talk too long. That's a problem that we often see. But there, my guidance is usually, especially when it comes to stories, sales stories, they should be pretty short, right? They should be between a minute and maybe two minutes long. They shouldn't be three to four minutes. There's not, let's say, leadership storytelling, not sales storytelling. And so what I do every single time that I share a story or when I craft a story, I ask myself, are there right now any details that I actually don't need, right? That don't serve any specific purpose in the story. That's the first question that I ask myself. And the second one is, would right now a fifth grader understand my story? If I told my, I don't know, my my nephew, my 10-year-old nephew, if I told my nephew right now that story, would he understand that? And if that's not the case, well, then it's likely too complicated. It's too long. It's it's not, it's not getting to the point. So I think just having these two checks can help that you actually share a story that is relevant and in the, exactly the right time frame. Got it. Okay. So the first one was the, um, it, it should be a minute at the most, one to two minutes, and then it should be able to be understood by a fifth grader. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Got it. And how do you, how, how do you practice this? Um, you know, say like if the, if, if you come up with a one good connector story and one good customer success story, if somebody's never done this before, can they, can you practice it? Uh, is this something, or you have to just make kind of make it up in the moment? <laughs> no, especially I, I'd say on the connection stories, you can make them up a little bit more in the moment when you practice a little bit, but the success story, these are well-crafted stories that you want to rehearse in advance. Now um, what are some tips to how to rehearse? the one thing that you should avoid by all costs. And that's a very, very common thing that we hear everywhere. Everyone keeps telling you, ah, rehearse in front of the mirror. Mm. Please, please, please. Anyone listening to that, don't do that. Why? Mm. Well, what's? Why would you ever in, look at yourself in the mirror while speaking, right? The only thing that you'll accomplish by doing that is that you get more self-conscious. You'll be like, oh, wait, what are these, what are these wrinkles under my eyes? Or am I, am I always, have I always looked like that? You're just getting more self-conscious. Mm. And so I'd say, don't look, don't rehearse in front of a mirror. What you should do instead, what I usually try to do before is I walk around my room, I speak out the story loud, and I try to move my gaze from one object to the other. So let's say here my speaker is one imaginary audience, then my camera, the other one, then my glass is the other imaginary audience. Whoever it is, I move deliberately from one object to the others. Why is that helpful? Because then it helps you be more deliberate about your eye contact, which is also extremely important for storytelling. Mm. But overall, yeah, I'd say speak out loud, do it while standing is usually a little bit better, deliberate eye contact. If you want to take it up an even extra notch, once in a while, I do it. I rehearse while speaking out loud in the street. It's not for everyone, but then you really train to remember the story. So I just walk out and walk and loud and speak out loud by myself. Okay. <laughs> well, people think probably that you're talking on the phone, so they don't think that you're strange or anything, right? 
So on purpose, I don't put in the headphones so oh. that I almost uh, that I seek that judgment by others because by getting putting myself into this slightly awkward situation, um, I learn how to deal with any uh, uncomfortable feeling. Okay, and and that that's a good segue, and that gives me a lot to practice. Um, now, one one quick thing I want to ask is um, on Zoom. Uh, is there a different set of rules on video conferencing or is it whether you're in person or on online? Mm, yeah, good question. I'd say the big difference is on Zoom, you want to try to have even more fun with your stories because, well, in person, you can communicate a little bit more with your body language, with your energy, but in Zoom, that's gone. And so, uh, when you talk on Zoom and when you share a story, just try to make it almost much friendly as you usually as you usually are. I usually have a pretty grumpy face, right? So I try to lighten up a little bit more in Zoom so that I look much friendlier, which I, uh, in real life, I don't have to do that much because people see my energy. But on Zoom, I try to take that up a notch. Got it. Okay. So, and can you practice on Zoom? Like, can you record yourself and then go back and watch it or... Is yeah. that you'd recommend it? Yeah, that that you can do. That's pretty powerful. That's actually pretty powerful because the moment that you look into the camera, not yourself, you don't have the same problem with the mirror. And it's actually good to see yourself, whether you're using pauses, maybe wrong, or maybe you look grumpy or whatever it is. It's really good to spot that. I'd say often it's very awkward, right? I hate watching myself. It's very powerful, but I hate it <laughs> just because <laughs> it sounds so different in how we think we sound, right? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, that made me think, you, you talk about constructive embarrassment. Um, and, and I don't know if this is in your book coming up, um, the story selling method, but um, tell us about constructive embarrassment and, and how you came up with that. Okay, sure. Yeah, so constructive embarrassment, that's when you put yourself on purpose in an embarrassing situation. Now, I know everyone is like wondering, why on earth would I do this, right? My life is full of embarrassing things. Why would I have more of that stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, when you put yourself on purpose in an embarrassing situation, you learn how to deal with feelings of judgment and you learn how to not give in that. Now, simple example, how can you practice constructive embarrassment? You go down into the street, the next stranger that comes by, you ask or you try to give them a high five, or you ask them for a hug, or you go into Starbucks and just sit or lie down on the floor. Whatever it is, the options are really endless. Whatever, what, and whatever gives you a little bit goosebumps and like, oh man, this is not, this is awkward. Well, that's a great opportunity. Now, why is that relevant for anyone working in sales? Because think about it, in sales. You, your primary role is pretty much to connect with the other person. When you're now thinking in your head, ah, oh, what am I going to say next? How's my story going to be perceived? Da, 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 da. We're all in our heads. We're not connecting with the other person. When you learn constructive embarrassment, you learn how to be in the moment, how to learn with feeling of judgment of feelings of rejection and just to feel them on your body and not to give in you'll be like anything that bad happens you get a rejection at, at work which in sales you get uh, all the time well you like you learn how to deal with rejection and you can actually use that to your advantage you can be with that feeling and actually be good with that got it so so it's it's getting outside of your comfort zone and mm -hmm. and where you can get used to that feeling and then, you know, move forward with more, more confidence, really, I, I would think. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Okay. It so that's constructive embarrassment. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I find it's um, when, when you have kids, like as they, as they start to pick out all of those little insecurities that you have, um, they're very good about, you know, um, bringing out things that you were hoping that nobody really noticed. <laughs> so I feel like they're really good at constructive embarrassment. And it's also interesting because we have sort of a, he's becoming a teenager and um, his whole life is about avoiding, you know, embarrassment at any cost, you know, and um, you know, that's how you, you get out of your comfort zone by being comfortable with being embarrassed basically. 
Exactly. Yeah. That, imagine we had learned something like constructive embarrassment before going to these really ugly years of being a teenager. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a very different experience than our. It's easy. <laughs> to, it's, yeah. I mean, it's easy to recommend, but it's, it's harder to do. I think e- even as you get older, um, you, you, you're trying to avoid embarrassment at, at mm. any cost, you know, and, and not get that, that feeling. But this sort of flips it around where it's like, actually, be embarrassed as much as possible in, in a law-abiding way, right? Don't, don't get in trouble. But um, yeah, get comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable, right? Yeah. There's a rule that you shouldn't obviously harm anyone else. And you should always be respectful of other people there, even though they might think that you're weird. Yes. Um, <laughs> I love it. Okay. So I'm going to take my dog for a walk after this and start at, um uh, practicing my storytelling, um, they'll think I'm talking to my dog. It's perfect. <laughs> so, so this is good. Philip, um, your book is coming out in March, The Storytelling story Selling Method. So what do you lay out in your book and w- what should we be expecting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, on Story Selling Method, it's really this hyper, hyper practical guide on how to tell stories and sales. And... I don't know. I've read so many books before and I get so upset when it's just 300 pages filled with fluff and things that I have to flip over. And so I just wanted to write a very, very practical book on how stories actually work in sales. For that, I interviewed in total 71 sales executives and sales leaders. So talk to some of the most accomplished sellers pretty much in the world. And all of the nuggets from the interviews from my workshops, I put into this one book. And pretty much what you'll learn there is, yes, how to take any, let's say, average moment and turn that into a beautiful story. If, let's say, you spill coffee over your shirt, that could be a life-transforming moment that you tell in a sales conversation. Or how to deliver a story with confidence. And also, what are the five stories that you need to tell to win more customers? So it's from a lot of different angles. But yeah, I think quick read. It will be short book and hopefully very practical for a lot of people that are out there. Oh, it's great. And to give them that structure, because everybody's got a lot of stories. You know, I, I think that people, um, you know, don't necessarily think that they're worth telling or that there's any value in it. But I mean, hey, every time you try something and fail or every time you're successful or if your company is successful in helping somebody, I mean, th- there's so many stories that you could bring up to, to help with this. That That's a good one because that was big premise of the book. Because what I saw before, what I saw in the books is a lot of the books, they focus on big storytelling. They're like, ah, oh, you have to climb Mount Everest to tell this amazing story. Mm-hmm. But my book is all about taking these small moments and turning them into beautiful stories. Because when you work in sales, if you tell a story about you, how you almost killed yourself climbing Mount Everest, that's not relatable. You want to share an experience that the other person can relate with. And that only comes through small stories. So the big focus of the book is very much on small moments that can be turned into beautiful stories. I love it. I, I love it. I'm trying I'm the wheels are turning in my head to to think of quick stories that a fifth grader, I have a fourth grader, so I can try it out on him. <laughs> See what he says. Um and uh and 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 use this to to relate and you know just get those stories out. So uh, Philip, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and I'm excited to get the book. Where can we get it and when does it come out? Perfect. No, thanks for having me. The book will be out probably mid-March and you can buy it on Amazon. Or if you want to check it out on my website first, that's storyselling.in. And there you will get immediately to the book where you can find more information on that as well. But also if you want to, hey, I'd love to be in touch with you on social media. So if you want to add me on LinkedIn, that's Philip Hum, H-U-M-M. I'd love for anyone to say hi. If you want to learn more about either storytelling or constructive embarrassment, I can send you my list of 30 activities. Uh, either way, I'd love to hear from you and hope that you get as much out of the book as lots of people have so far. Yep, that's great. I will do that and we'll put all the links um, in the show notes so everybody can 
get it and and um just really appreciate all the advice on storytelling so thank you philip thanks a lot for having me david